Let us worship the triune God. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as the builder of the house has more honor than the house itself. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Almighty God, our Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus because we come to you in the blood and righteousness of Jesus alone. And we come to worship you because you are worthy of all praise. Father, in your infinite love, you sent your son for us when we were still your enemies. And he came willingly to die for us in order to fulfill all justice. And then you sent your spirit and he came and gave us your peace that passes all understanding and your joy that can never be taken away. And he united us to you in your son and the spirit has taught us how to walk in your ways of holiness and wisdom and love. And so we worship you now, Father, Son, and Spirit, one God, because you are good, world without end, and amen. Amen. The text this morning is Psalm 120. These are the words of God. In my distress, I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, O O thou false tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. Woe is me for that I sojourn in Meshech, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, for, but when I speak they are for war. Our Father, gracious God, we thank you for the privilege that we have of gathering together like this. We thank you for the opportunity to have your word open before us. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We pray that he would take this word and apply it to our hearts, our lives, our condition. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, and amen. Amen. Some of you may recall that a few months ago I was doing a 10-part series through the next decade of Psalms, and we got to Psalm 119, and then we got interrupted. So this is not going to feel like the conclusion of a series, but that's what it is. Psalm 120 is the text before us. And it is certainly good to see you all again, although you all have very nice cars. <laughs> well, well done. But it's just not the same. I was, I was reflecting that there might be a parable in that. Some people go to church in cars their entire lives. They're, they, they don't really show up, or they show up, but it's all encased in metal. Um, it's... People that we love God, we love one another. We want to relate to one another as saints of the living God, and we want to be honest, be present, and be aware as we're doing that. And this psalm is going to help us with that. This psalm is the first in a series of 15 psalms called from ancient times Psalms of Ascent or Psalms of Degree, Psalms of, in some way, going up. What this means is frankly lost to us, but there have been reasonable speculations. John Calvin thought it had to do with the musical pitch of the psalm. He thought it had to do with the the notation going up. A medieval rabbi, one medieval rabbi, said that the temple had 15 steps, one psalm per step. So as as you were sending the steps of the temple, 15 of them, you would sing one psalm per step. I favor the view that argues that these are pilgrim psalms, When Israelites went to Jerusalem to worship at the temple, they were going up, and they spoke of it that way. In Exodus 34, 24, 1 Kings 12, 27, uh, the temple was on a mountain. Uh, You would go up to worship the Lord. And if you're going from another part of Israel, you were going up to worship the Lord. And that's how it came into their language. So I would take these 15 psalms of ascent as pilgrim psalms, Uh, psalms that Israelites would sing on their way to Jerusalem. Now, when a pilgrim left home to go up to the temple, he was going up to worship the God of truth. He was leaving behind the realm of men, all that realm down below, the provenance of liars, the realm of liars. If you want to go up From that realm, you go up into the presence of God. Now, one likely, we don't know this for sure, but one likely occasion for the composition of this psalm is David's recollection of the lies of Doeg the Edomite. 
You remember when that time when David was running from King uh, Saul before he was an open uh, refugee, but when, when things were just starting to go south between him and King uh, Saul. He came to the tabernacle, he did, weaponless, and he came to the tabernacle and he was given uh, Goliath's old sword. Doeg the Edomite was there and reported that to Saul. Now, of course, that's not the lie of Doeg. Um, he's not uh, lying that David was there because David was there. But the lie uh, more likely had to do with David is plotting against you or David is, is running from you. He's, he's uh, conspiring against you in some way, which is, which is a lie that Saul was prepared, prepped in some way to hear. But the lies, whatever the lies were, were distressing to David, and the psalmist cries out to Jehovah, and Jehovah heard him. Verse 1, Jehovah heard him. So in the, in the first expression, the first outburst of this psalm, David acknowledges that his petition has been heard. In my distress, I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. He cries out for deliverance from the evils that come from a lying tongue. Verse 2, the lips are, the lips are soft, but in the service of the devil, the lips can be razor sharp. The lips are soft, but, that, uh, but appearances are deceiving. Lies can be razor sharp. He then asks what the liar will receive in return for all of his labor in lies. Verse 3, and there's ambiguity in the next verse. Is it talking about harm done by the liar? Or is it talking about the recompense that God pays back to the liar? Is, uh, is verse 4 talking about the damage the liar does? Or is it talking about the damage God does to the liar when God brings judgment upon him? I take it as the latter. It's damage done. It's the recompense being brought to the liar by God in verse 4. David did not physically live in Meshech or in the tents of Kedar, but it was as though he dwelt among an uncouth, and fierce and barbaric people, verse 5, a people that did not have a strong attachment to the truth, given the basic theme of this psalm. Against his basic desire, he dwelt together with someone who hated peace, verse 6. Despite his longing for peace and despite his desire for peace, no matter what, they wanted war, verse 7. They insisted on unnecessary Conflict. Now, you might wonder about the transition from slander and deception and lies to peace and war at the conclusion of uh, the psalm. I believe it has been well said that in, when, whenever war breaks out, whenever there's conflict, the first casualty of war is the truth. The first thing people start doing is lying. And sometimes, as you're, as you're going to see in a moment, sometimes when the cause is righteous, uh, it's, uh, it's not... The same, it's not a sin to engage in deception in wartime, but there are times when your cause is unjust and you're lying about the, the reasons for going to war. If you claim the enemy attacked you and the enemy didn't attack you, or if it was a false flag operation, uh, those sorts of things, lying and deception and the desire or the lust for conflict are things that go together. Now, one of the things that is exasperating about dealing with slanderers and liars is not the mere fact of conflict with them. Now, I have to say something. Um, I said one of the things that's so exasperating. We have to, why don't we rephrase that and say one of the things that tempts us to be exasperated, although we aren't going to be, uh, because Jesus tells us not to be exasperated. Jesus says when people lie about you, when they slander you, when they heave all manner of dead cat at you, and they, they do this, and you're standing there saying, what did I do? What did, I do? What did you do? And then they'll say, I'll tell you, here's another thing you did, and they lie again. Jesus says explicitly, when that happens, you're supposed to rejoice. He says, in that day, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. In that day, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Jesus commands his people to rejoice when the enemies of God lie about him and lie about you. So we are simply tempted to be exasperated at this point. We're not actually exasperated at this point because Jesus told us not to be. Jesus told us 
to expect this. Jesus said, this is how they treated all the prophets in the Old Testament. They lied about the prophets in the Old Testament. And you're going to be the servant of the same God that they were and expect completely different treatment? No, that's not, that's not how it's going to go. So, but the thing that is a temptation to exasperation is this. The people who are lying about you feel free to use maneuvers that the righteous are forbidden, prohibited from using in return. You're wrestling with them, and they can use holds that you can't use. They can uh, employ tricks that you can't employ. They are far more flexible in their construal of the facts because they don't need to go to the library to check on any of them. They don't have any research time. They can just sit down at the keyboard and start typing. What are the, what are the comprehensive examinations necessary to become an internet troll? How arduous, how arduous is the examination period? Do you, have to, do you need grad school? Well, actually, you, a lot of times you do. <laughs> but that's a different, that's a different subject. Uh, you don't need to research things that you're just making up. If you're just throwing everything against the wall to see what sticks, man, I'll accuse them of this, and I'll accuse them of this, and I'll accuse them of that. Uh, we're, we're bound to hit the truth in here somewhere. No. That, that, that the accuser is really flexible. And the person who is committed to the truth is constrained by the truth and, and you're being accused of something, some conversation that happened 15 years ago and you've got to go check and you've got to check with friends. Well, did, I, did this happen? And you have to hunt things down. You've, you've got to spend time researching. Why? Because you care about the truth. And they don't care about the truth and so they can just go on to the next thing. And then while you're looking that up, you can go on to the next thing. So, a true man will not even touch the weapons that the slanderers resort to so readily. A true man will not even touch those weapons. A true man will not return that kind of fire. A true man will not try to blacken the character of someone who is blackened enough already. Why gob mud at somebody who lives in the mud? What, what, are, you, what are you supposed to do? There, there's an old adage, never... Um, Never wrestle with a pig in a pig pen because uh, the pig, you're, you're just going to get as dirty as the pig and the pig likes it, okay? You, you, there's, there's no future in it. There's no value in it. So why are you trying to blacken? There's, there's no reason to try to blacken the character of someone whose character is blackened enough already. Now, I alluded to this at the beginning of the message, but I want to uh, dig into this because there's an important distinction that we have to make. Having said all of this, we have to acknowledge that there's a difference between slander, when there ought to be comity, when there ought to be friendship, when there ought to be fellowship, and someone is just slandering or lying. That is evil. God rejects it. God hates it, as we're going to see shortly. And that condition over against deception when there's already warfare or a state of war going on. Well, what do I mean? One of the things, if, if we want to be God's people, if we want to be honest, uh, honest, be, honest before God, we have, to learn, we have to not only speak the truth, but we have to be prepared to listen to truth when God speaks to us. We have to be honest in our exegesis. We have to be honest as we handle this word. All right? We can't go out and speak the word, uh, 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 speak the word truthfully with that definition of truth being established for us by a very pious tradition within Christianity. That's not the same thing as being biblical. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, there, there are some Christians that have an absolutist position with regard to no deception ever in, under any circumstances. No deception ever under any circumstances. So um, they, they say, well... You, you just can't because they're, they are the verbal equivalent of pacifists. In a war, in a war, killing, in a just war, killing is not murder. In, in Exodus 20, it forbids murder in the Ten Commandments. And then within, a, within just a chapter, you've got the requirements for capital punishment under circum, cer, certain circumstances. Taking a life is not murder. Deceiving the enemy in warfare is not lying. Deceiving the enemy in warfare is not lying. Um, in the Second World War, before, uh, 
uh, be, before the invade D-Day invasion, there was not, not only did we have the troops massed up where they were staged in order to invade at Normandy, there was also a big army built out of plywood in another part of England so that Hitler would think that we were massing forces there. Now, was that a breach of the Ninth Commandment? Well, you know, you do as you would be done by. If, we, if, if they were invading us, we wouldn't want... <laughs> we, uh, yeah, uh, use your head here. Use your head. Uh, lying, lying, deception and warfare is, uh, is to lying in the prohibited sense the same way killing and warfare is to murder. Right? They, they have the same basic relationship. But some Christians have a, an idea that we, I must speak the exact truth no matter what. I must speak the exact precise truth no matter what the circumstances. Um, you may have read the story of Betsy Ten Boom, uh, Corey's uh, sister, I think, who was one time asked by a Nazi officer, Do you, are, are you hiding any Jews here? And they, they were. They were in a uh, cubbyhole under the table. And she said, yes, we, we are. And he said, where? And she said, under the table, and laughed. And the officer looked under the table, nobody there, and huffed off, stomped off. And, and she said, you know, she could say, well, see, God vindicated my commitment to truth-telling. I'd say, no, you're just a very, very good liar. <laughs> you're just very, tra- you've doubled, you've got it down to a science. And, and you've lied to yourself. Another time, someone with the same convictions, this was centuries before, in the time of the Covenanters, uh, a young girl was going to a Bible study, going to a secret illegal meeting, and she was stopped by some soldiers and asked, where are you going? Where are you going? Direct question. Where are you going? And she said, well, my elder brother died, and we're having a reading of his last will and testament to find out what he left for us. Okay, carry on. <laughs> See, God vindicated, God vindicated my commitment to truth-telling. No, you're just very tricksy. We, we have to keep an eye on you all we keep an eye on you all the time. You can't defend yourself with technicalities, right? You, uh, those of you who are students uh, studying, if, you, if, if your parents said, oh, how, was, um, how was church this Sunday? And you said it was great. Uh, Pastor Wilson preached sober this week. Now, is that true? Yes, it's true. Completely 100% true. But when you say the, the, the pastor came in sober this week, What's the implication? You can tell lies by telling the truth. You can tell a lie by rolling your eyes. You can tell your, uh, a lie by laughing and saying, look, look who's under the table. You know, you can, well, this is complicated, right? No, it's not complicated. It's not complicated. In, if, you, if you're a Christian and you are, let's say you get a job with some, one of our intelligence agencies and you're on a secret, noble, godly mission overseas to some closed country, and, it, and at the border they ask you, are you with the CIA? And you're a Christian. Do You have to say, well, yes, actually, thank you for this opportunity to come clean. <laughs> come on. The Hebrew midwives were blessed by God because they misled Pharaoh in his murderous policy. Now, I, I'm, what I'm arguing is in warfare or in conditions that are warlike. Conditions of wartime were like conditions. This, is, uh, this has the same relationship that killing and murder do, deception and lying. The Hebrew midwives were blessed by God because they misled Pharaoh in his murderous policy. Exodus 1, 19 and 20. They said, uh, they lied. To, so he issued, you've got to kill the, boy, the Hebrew boys. And they wouldn't do that. They disobeyed the first instance. And then when Pharaoh asked about it, they told him a story. And, and then God said to the Hebrew midwives, that was a good job right there. I'm going to give you families of your own. That was well done. God bless you. Right? And Jochebed, the mother of Moses, Jochebed, the mother of Moses, obeyed Pharaoh technically by putting the baby Moses into the Nile. That was the command, right? Throw your babies into the Nile. Throw your, expose your children. The law didn't say that the baby couldn't be given a boat. <laughs> There's always a loophole. All right. So she nursed the baby along until he's a little sturdier, and then she makes the little boat and puts him in the Nile. I obeyed. No, not really. The Mo- and, then, and Moses asked Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go away from Egypt for a three-day journey into the wilderness, not forever and ever, Exodus 9.1. 
That was the request. And Pharaoh, no dummy, Pharaoh was no dummy. He said, well, the men can go. And Moses is saying, no, no, men, women, children, cattle, everything we've got. We've got to go out for three days in the wilderness. Pharaoh's th thought bubble over Pharaoh's head, yes, and then you will keep on going. Yes, exactly. But that's what Moses was asking for. Rahab deceived the agents of Jericho's defenses by sending the spies out by another way than she said she did. That's in Joshua 2.4 and James 2.25. James 2.25 is important because uh, when James tells us about this, he is, um, it's quite striking that, that uh, this moment is considered by James as the moment when Rahab's faith was vindicated as genuine. Likewise, also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? What, what do we mean by another way? Another way than she said she did. Right? That's what vindicates her faith as genuine. And the strategy that Israel used at the second battle of Ai relied on deception, Joshua 8.2, using a tactic God gave them. And the tactic that God gave to, to David at Baal Perazim relied on deception, 2 Samuel 5.23. Deception in time of war is to lying what killing in war is to murder. Deception in warfare is to lying what killing in war is to murder. So, if you're the kind of person who's tormented because in pickup basketball games, you sometimes fake left and drive right. <laughs> Have you ever done that? Ninth commandment, friend. And then, <laughs> and your brother who comes to you after, you know, where do you go to church? You know, what kind of, what kind of Christianity is that? What kind of Christianity is that? You scored on me 28 times. So, Nevertheless, having said all that, God will pour out all his fury on liars. God will pour out all his fury on liars. The lake of fire is reserved for all liars, Revelation 21.8. God takes a very dim view of this kind of falsehood. One of the Ten Commandments prohibits perjury against your neighbor, Exodus 20, verse 16. Remember I said earlier that that lying, falsehood, disrupts the, the bonds of fellowship, disrupts the bonds of community. That when you ought to have fellowship, when you ought to have neighborliness, when you ought to have friendship, uh, what, and you introduce lying, when you, when you bring in lying to a community like this in a church, or if you lie in a family, when you lie to the authorities, what are you doing? You are, it's the, in effect, you are declaring war. You're declaring war. That you're saying things are serious enough that when Pharaoh says, kill the baby boys, and you're going to say, let me think about it. No. When you're at that point, when you're at that point, then you don't need to worry about it. But when you are fellowshipping, when, you're, when it's a husband and wife relationship, or when it's a parent-child relationship, or when it's brother to brother in the congregation, or it's neighbor to neighbor, what should you do? Leviticus 19.11, we, uh, very simple. We t speak the truth. Truth speaking is a precondition of peace. Truth speaking is necessary to peace. When you start lying, you start eroding trust. When you start eroding trust, what you're doing is you're setting everything up for one conflict after another. We must not lie to one another. Leviticus 19.11. Lying is included in two of the seven things that God hates. In Proverbs 6.16-19. 6, through 19, Six things are, uh, the Lord hates, seven are an abomination to him. Two of those seven things include lying. In Colossians 3, 9, because we have cast off the old man and his ways, we must not lie to one another. Why must we not lie to one another? Because God has brought us together in the bonds of peace. We are to be at peace with one another. We are to love one another. We are to cultivate fellowship with one another. And lying is a corrosive. Lying wrecks peace. Lying is a threat to peace. Once someone has lied to you, everything they say after that, unless they deal with it rightly, unless they deal with it honestly, everything they say after that is you've got this question mark in the back of your head, sometimes in the front of your mind. Is that true? Is that true? 
Is that true? Is that true? And what, when you've sown that kind of distrust, it's not going to be long at all before you have open conflict. If you want to know what one of the antecedent causes of quarrels, fights, disputes, lawsuits, go upstream far enough and you're going to find lies. We are servants of Christ, who is the truth incarnate. We are servants of Christ, and he is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This means that we must be men and women who speak the truth accurately. We must be men and women who speak the truth accurately. We must be boys and girls who do not lie. And I want to speak to you boys and girls for a moment, and I want to remind you that basically there are situations when the Hebrew midwives are, are, are dealing with Pharaoh, when Rahab is dealing with the authorities of Jericho. There are situations like that where you are in conflict. It's a godly war. You don't have to, you don't have to um, uh, paint your tank orange. All the other guys have their tank painted in camo. And you say, I don't want the enemy to think I'm a bush when I'm not a bush. So I'm going to paint it bright orange like I'm out hunting, right? Um, no, it doesn't. Uh, that's... It just doesn't work that way. But I want you kids to know that you are not, when you're growing up in your family, when you're growing up in a Christian community, you are not in that first set of circumstances. You are in the second. You are in a family where you are commanded to speak the truth and maintain the peace. Husbands and wives, you're commanded to speak the truth and maintain the peace. Do not lie to one another. Why? Because that disrupts, that corrodes, that breaks apart the bonds of fellowship. Stop lying. Now, here's the temptation. For those of you growing up in, uh, in a Christian church that has a high view of moral order, that we have a high view of what God says to do, we want to maintain biblical standards of living in all the things that we do. Your parents don't want you cheating at your schoolwork. Your parents don't want you telling stories to kids up and down the street. We care about the truth. We care about moral order. We care about all of these things, right? We care about them. That means that, means that if you're growing up in a community like that, the pressure on you, kids, to be hypocritical at time, from time to time, the pressure on you to be hypocritical is going to be enormous, the pre oftentimes people talk about, uh, well, old people are, uh, have a particular temptation to hypocrisy. No, I've noticed the older some people get, sometimes they feel very free about t <laughs> telling the world exactly what they think. <laughs> right? Oftentimes when you're dealing with older people, what you hear is what you get. What you see is what you get. But if you're a dependent, if your next meal is coming from these people that uh, told you to made you make your bed and you didn't make your bed, right? These people, you want to maintain peace with mom and dad. You want to, you're dependent on them entirely. You can't make your own way in the world. They've got these very strict standards. And on top of all that, you, like the rest of us, are born into a sinful fallen race and you're going to have the temptation to shade, shade the truth or to say something different or to just straight up lie. The pressure on you to do that is going to be enormous because that's the easy, simple way out, you think. That's the easy, straightforward way out. Your mom says, did you make your bed the way, uh, the, the way I asked you to? I asked you to make your bed. Uh, did you make your bed? And you say, yes. Or, brought up in the South, yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And thought bubble over your head is define made. <laughs> or define asked. You just said there that you asked me to do it. You didn't tell me to do it. No, I told you to do it, by, but in a polite way. I asked you to make your bed. Define made. Or you think, okay, the chronology, God lives in a timeless eternity. It doesn't matter if I say, yes, I did, and run up there right now and make it. That, all that kind of rationalization, you're lying to yourself, and the pressure on you to get out of trouble, the pressure on you to... to uh, fudge something, to plagiarize something for a paper or to cheat on a test or to do... The pressure is on you to be the kind of achiever that your folks think you ought to be or that you think your folks think you ought to be or whatever it is that's going on in your head or your heart. You must be boys and girls who do not lie. You think, well, what, okay, 
you caught me dead to right, so the, this, is, this has been going on. I'll confess it. What do I do? Tell God the truth. Tell God the truth, and then tell your parents the truth. Tell God the truth. Well, first, tell yourself the truth. Right? Tell, tell yourself the truth, and use the right word. Don't say, well, there was a little bit of spin, or I left a, little of, I left a few of the details out. No, look in the mirror and say, I am a liar. Uh, that was a lie, and that makes me, I'm the one who told it, I am a liar. You tell yourself the truth. Tell yourself the truth, then you tell God the truth, and then you go tell your folks the truth. Tell yourself the truth, tell God the truth, and then go tell your folks the truth. Go tell whoever it was you lied to the truth. Now, the, you think, well, they would chase me down the street throwing rocks at me. You know, they would disown me forever and ever. No, they wouldn't. The parent, your parents, believe it or not, your parents already know that you sin. Your parents already know that you're fallen. They know that about themselves. They know that about you. They don't want to look at you and see a perfect child. They know they already don't have one. They know that. They want to look at you and see someone in whom the Holy Spirit is at work. That's what they want to see. And when a kid busts himself, mom, dad, you know, last uh, six months ago or last week or whatever it was, when I told you thus and such, that wasn't true. I lied to you. That is, for, for godly parents, for shrewd parents, for, for intelligent Christian parents, that is a sign that God's at work, the Holy Spirit's at work. Because people on their own don't do that. On their own, in the flesh, when, it, when it's only the flesh operating, we don't tell the truth about ourselves in a way that busts ourselves unless the Holy Spirit is brought, has brought us to that point. And so, we must be men and women who speak the truth accurately. We must be boys and girls who do not lie. Now, this psalm begins with a grateful acknowledgement that God heard the prayer of this man in distress. God heard him, verse 1. <clears throat> and this is part of the reason why I take the arrows of verse 4 as the arrows of God's judgments and not the devastation caused by the lying. The previous verse, verse 3, asked the question, <clears throat> what shall be done to you, O false tongue? And the following verse answers the question. God already heard the prayer, in, heard the, the request in verse 1. What shall be done to the liar in verse 3? And then in verse 4, God brings judgment. God will draw one of his mighty arrows out of his quiver, and you don't want to be one of those condemned individuals that God draws a bead on. God is a good shot. The white broom tree of the desert, Ratam, rendered by the KJV as juniper, is a wood that burns hot and long. These judgments are fierce. These judgments are fierce. But here's the, here's the glorious thing. When we try to blow sunshine at God, when we think, I am on top of this, I can manage this, I can spin it, you're thinking, you're, you've got way too big a view of yourself. Remember, that not only are you not as wise as God, you're not, as, you're not as smart as the devil. You're not as smart. He's been lying to people for a long, long time. And you can't draw yourself up to your full height and say, I am an eight-year-old boy, and I'm smarter than the devil. That kind of thing might make for a good folk song with the devil going down to Georgia and, and losing fiddle, fiddle contests, but those are folk tales. Those are folk tales. That's not the way it works. The devil is smarter than you are. The devil is smarter than you are. And your only defense against him, your only defense against his lies, is Jesus Christ. That is your only possible defense. Everything else, anything else you try to do, you're being snookered. You're, you, uh, God is going to bring it all down to you. And, and here's the thing. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, I, I asked earlier, what do I do? I've, yeah, I've, I've got this pattern of lying in the home, and it's been disruptive. What do I do? In 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word for confess there is hama legeo, to speak literally, to speak the same thing. Hama means the same. Legeo means to speak. So to speak the same thing. When God says, that's a lie, you say, amen, that's a, that was a lie. 
Yes, Lord, that was a lie. You don't call it prevarication. You don't call it create, creative writing. You don't call it something else. You call it a lie. And when you confess your sin, see, if you're running from God, trying to come up with any other shield from God other than the Lord Jesus Christ, you, what happens in verse 4 is what is going to be severe judgment. Severe judgment is brought down on the person who wants to be smarter than the devil and wiser than God. Smarter than the devil, you're not, and wiser than God, you're not. And God brings hard, severe judgment against people who will not tell the truth. They will not tell the truth. And it's, it's, it's hard. The, li the life of the wicked is hard. But then if you confess your sin, if you just repent, if you just drop it, if you let go of all your foolish pride, just drop it and you turn around and you confess. Homo legeo, you speak the same thing and say, God, you call this a lie. I want to call it the same thing. I want to stop lying. You will find nothing but mercy, nothing but mercy, nothing but forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you stop running and turn around and drop the lie, you will just simply be received. Like the prodigal son was received by his father, coming back disheveled and in rags, having spent all of his father's money on prostitutes, he comes back and his father runs to meet him. If you stop lying, that is your reception. Stop lying and that is your reception. Continue with the lying, continue with the lying, and you're going to be in the position of the older brother in that parable. Notice that the father goes out of the house for both sons. The father goes out of the house for both sons. And he's looking down the road and he runs to meet the prodigal son and he goes out to talk to the, elder, uh, the older brother, the self-righteous brother. The father is the, the father. His, his um, character is constant. So, what do we do? We live in a time that is dominated by the lie. We live in a time that is dominated by the lie. The lie is the coin of the realm. The lie comes at you from every direction. You, you are lied to in your Spotify playlist. You are lied to in the movies, in the books you read, and you are lied to on the internet. You are lied to by your culture. You are lied to by political authorities. And you are lied to by the devil. Now, I was talking about telling lies. Now I'm talking about listening to them. There's a connection. Keep in mind that it is a sin to believe a lie. It is a sin to, be, to be, believe a lie. Um, this, is how, this is how our race fell into sin in the first place. God cannot lie, right? God is all truth. He cannot lie. Hebrews 6, 18. And he told Adam to stay away from that tree. He told him if he ate from that tree, he was going to surely die. The one who cannot lie told Adam, if you eat that fruit, you will surely die. Those were words of truth. The devil wreathes himself in lies, and he is the one who told them to go right on ahead. He's the one who said, you will not die. That's not going to happen. So the liar said, you're not going to die. The truth telling God said, you will die. The fall was the result of believing a lie. The fall was the, the result of believing a lie. Remember, when the, when the devil, the devil is already a defeated foe, lying is all he has. That's the only weapon he has anymore. He's been defeated. He's been disarmed. He's been, he's been overthrown. God has destroyed him through the cross of Jesus Christ. He has the power of death. God destroyed him who has the power of death. That is the devil. In Colossians, the principalities and powers were disarmed, and Jesus made a, humiliated them. The principalities and powers, the ruler of this age, has been disarmed from all his actual authority. The only authority he has anymore is that he's the father of lies. He's the father of lies. And when you're lying, when you're, when you're telling stories, when you're shading the truth, when you're doing all of those things, you are exhibiting a family resemblance that you don't want to exhibit. Jesus said, when Jesus is talking to the, the Jews and they said, we are, Abraham is our father, Jesus said, if he were your father, there'd be a family resemblance. 
if, he, if Abraham were your father, you would look more like him. You are of your father the devil. Why? How can he say that? There's a family resemblance. Liars are betraying their paternity. Lying and truth-telling is a, is a God-given paternity test. Who's your father? Who's your father? Are you serving the one who is the father of lights in whom there's no variation or shadow due to change? Or are you serving the one who, who Jesus says when he lies, he speaks his native language. The devil lies all the time. The devil lies constantly. You, as Christians, shall know the truth, Jesus says, and the truth shall set you free. You might say, well, if I tell the truth about all these, if I tell the truth, that's just going to get me in trouble. Jesus said, the truth is going to set you free. The truth is going to set you free. The truth is not going to land you sideways in all kinds of monstrous scruples. Telling the truth is liberating. Telling the truth is liberating. It's joy, it's peace, it's release. So, one of the central ways to immunize yourself against believing lies is by resolving before God that you will speak the truth. You're going to resolve before God that you're going to speak the truth. But remember, we've already seen that Jesus identifies himself as the truth. So when we come to speak the truth, and your mom says, did you make your bed? And you, it, it has to get to the level of propositions. You need to speak the truth when it comes to those sorts of statements. But you don't start there. You don't start there. You start by speaking Jesus. The ultimate truth, ultimate reality, is personal. Jesus is the truth, and he is personal. That means when you want to guard yourself against listening to lies, you have to guard yourself by, against that by speaking the truth. And when you speak the truth, you are speaking Jesus. You are speaking Jesus. Jesus is the only shield and the only buckler, the only defense, the only way to protect yourself from the lies of the world. And when you get all wrapped up in the lies of the world, one of the first things that will happen is you're going to start echoing, you're going to start mimicking what you're hearing, and you're going to become one of the liars. You're going to join in on the chorus. The devil's going to sing the verse, and you sing the chorus along with everybody else. That's, what, that's what's happening to our generation. That's what's happening to our generation of Christians. The devil sings the verse, and we all join in on the chorus. What you want to do is answer when the devil invites you to join in on the chorus, you want to answer with Jesus Christ. Answer with the truth. He is the truth. When you pray to God the Father, we are taught in Scripture to pray in the name of Jesus. We're to do what we do in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen, at the end of your prayers is not our code for open your eyes now. This is not our secret message, our secret way of saying this is a signal to all the kids that they can reach for the pancakes. That's not what in Jesus' name, amen, means. In Jesus' name, amen, means that you must begin by speaking Jesus to the Father. You extend that by speaking Jesus to those around you. You speak Jesus to your parents, speak Jesus to your wife, speak Jesus to your husband, speak Jesus to your children. You speak Jesus to God first, and you speak Jesus to others. That will translate at the end of the day into true propositions about whether you made your bet or not. It's going to get there. But you don't start there. If you just start with grit your teeth and tell the truth, come hell or high water, you're go that's just the law. That you're just going to come under the law. And, and coming under the law means that you're going to feel the weight of it and you're going to crater. You're going to buckle under the weight of the law. The law cannot make you right with God. The law cannot make you a lover of the truth. Jesus, who is the truth, can summon you into a relationship where you love God the Father through Jesus Christ and you love the truth. You speak the truth. Why? Because you love it. You don't speak the truth because you gotta. You speak the truth because you love it. And you speak the truth and you love the truth because you love him. And you love him because he came to this world. He lived a perfect sinless life. He died on the cross. He was buried in the ground. And he rose from the dead and he ascended to the right hand of God the Father. And that is the truth. That is truth's storyline. And truth's storyline means that you can love him. He's alive. You can come to the Father 
through the one who is at his right hand. And because you love him, you love the truth. And because you love the truth, you speak anything, anything that resembles the truth, anything that reminds you of the truth. The, tr the true propositions that you say about whether you made your bed or not or whether you did that assignment or not, the reason you say that is not because uh, technically I'm a Christian kid and I'm supposed to do the right thing and that's the right thing, check that box and I'm going to grit my teeth and do the right thing no matter what. No, you, you answer truthfully because that answer reminds you of Jesus and you love him. And you love him because he first loved you. You love him because he reached down to you first. He spoke the truth to you before you ever spoke the truth to anybody. He spoke the truth to you. And that true thing, that, that true summons, those true words that came to you were the words, follow me. Jesus comes to every true disciple and says, follow me, come. Our Father in God, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you for this word. We thank you for this psalm. We thank you for the privilege of being back together again. We thank you for all of it uh, in the name of Jesus. We thank you that we can come to you in his name, uh, clothed in his righteousness. And as we do, we would repeat back to, to you the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Do you know God? It can sound like a simple question. Maybe you hear it so often that you don't think about it, but it might also be a troubling question. It can sometimes seem difficult to explain how you can know the infinite God. It can seem strange to describe knowing a being that you can't see. So how can we know God? The answer is that the only way to know God is for God to reveal himself to you. He must show himself to you. And the good news is that he has done precisely that. He has spoken to you in his word. He has spoken to you in his created word. He also speaks in the preached word of the gospel. And he reveals himself here at this table. And all of this is possible because God has come and revealed himself to us in person, in the man, Jesus Christ. In fact, the Bible says that as we read and hear and believe these words, we are actually coming to see God and coming to truly know him. Paul says that when Christ was preached to the Galatians, he was actually set before their eyes. In the preaching of the cross, Christ is displayed. So, Christ was just proclaimed to you. Did you see him there? Did you see him there for you? And John says, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him. 1 John 5.20 when we learn about God, about who he is, he is revealing himself to us. And what does he reveal? He reveals that he is Father, Son, and Spirit, an eternal fellowship of love and joy and delight. And that is what he invites you to share with him here at this table. This is what your God is like. He comes, he shares, he gives, he forgives, he welcomes. Do you see that? Do you love that? Then you know him. And so come and welcome to Jesus Christ. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks. So let's pray together. Our God and Father, we praise you and we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your love for us, particularly in sending your son for us, who died and rose again and now is seated at your right hand. Father, thank you for revealing yourself to us in him and in your word and here at this table. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name, amen. It's so good to be back together, amen? amen. So hear the word, hear the truth that's been proclaimed to you. Christ has been proclaimed to you. He is the truth and he is the truth that sets all men free. If you've been pricked, if you've been touched, if, if, if God has stirred something up in your heart that you know you need to take care of it, you need to deal with it. Talk to your parents, talk to your pastor, talk to a trusted friend, deal with it. Don't just say that was a nice experience. No, you met with the living God this morning. You met with him and he met with you and now he sends you out with his blessing. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself, God, even our Father who hath loved us and given us an everlasting consolation and good hope through his grace, comfort your hearts now and establish you in every good word and work 
and amen.